If you're new to Instant Pot cooking, then this is the video for you. Hi, I'm Lisa Childs and I am an Instant Pot expert, food blogger, YouTuber, cookbook author, and I love to help people feel confident using their Instant Pot. So people have loved my other Instant Pot recipe compilation videos, so I thought I'd make a new one just in time for any new Instant Pot users that got them over the holidays. Enjoy. Someone literally commented that they picked my YouTube video because there was an Asian girl on the thumbnail. But honestly, let's be real. No one does rice like Asians do. So let me teach you how to make perfect Instant Pot rice. I'm pretty confident here that literally no Japanese person would eat long grain white rice, at least in Japan. I make my short grain white rice in my Japanese rice cooker most Asian thing ever. But I'd say that most people in the US use either long grain white rice, basmati rice, or jasmine rice. This method will work for all three of those the same. This method will not work the same for brown rice, short grain rice, or medium grain rice. In my last video, where I'm literally wearing the same outfit, I got a lot of the same comments. So I'm gonna go through all of those, answer all your questions on how to make the rice. Today we're making long grain white rice in my Instant Pot Duo Plus and my Instant Pot Duo Original. I'm doing two Instant Pots, so I'm measuring one cup of rice for one and three cups of rice for the other. Do you want to know the secret to getting great engagement on a YouTube video? Just don't wash your rice. And people could not be more divided on this. For me, I always wash my Japanese rice, my wild rice, my brown rice. It just never really occurred to me to wash my long grain white rice just because that's what it says on the package. However, YouTube came after me and they were not happy. John Lennon writes, she did not wash the rice before cooking it. What the actual is this? Yikes. Because I don't want more engagement today, I guess I'm going to wash it. I have sold hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these rice washing baskets. You need to get one. First Instant Pot gets one cup of rice washed. Three cups in here. And no, rinsing the rice does not change the amount of water that you need or the time. Next is the water ratio. For every one cup of rice, I like to add one and a quarter cup of water. So the ratio is one to 1.25. Give it a shake to evenly distribute. The ratio for three cups of rice is the same one to 1.25. So I'm adding three and three quarters of a cup of water to my three cups of rice. Of course, you can add chicken broth, beef broth, bouillon, whatever you want for more flavor. Just a dash of salt and shake. And now we cook. Now this is super important before you cook, you need to ensure that your sealing knob is in the sealing position. If it is over here in the venting position, all the water is going to evaporate out of this hole and then your rice will burn. If you have one of these models that has the updated lid, then this is already done for you. It's default to the ceiling. Now, if you're new to Instant Pot cooking, this rice button is a preset. It goes to 12 minutes on low pressure, which you can use, but I prefer to just use a manual setting. To cook Instant Pot rice, press the manual button right here and adjust the time. My tried and true method is three minutes on high pressure. The other thing you need to remember is to make sure that this keep warm button is on before you start pressure cooking. Otherwise it will not do the natural pressure release. Our rice is done pressure cooking and now we're going to check it out. If your Instant Pot still has the pin up like this, just go ahead and release the rest of the pressure. So now we're going to fluff up our rice. So I thought I was recording and I wasn't, but this is the one cup of rice. It's perfect. And then this is three cups of rice with three and three quarters cup of water. See so you no know sticking, perfectly fluffy. And you want to fluff it up like this before you serve it always. We've got perfectly cooked rice here. 
There's a quick warning. If you leave your Instant Pot rice in the Instant Pot on keep warm for a long extended period of time, it can get sticky, it can burn, it can stick to the rest of your pot. So be careful. The first recipe you should never make again on the stovetop are mashed potatoes. First rinse and wash your potatoes, then peel them and cut into one inch cubes. If you cut into halves or they're bigger, make sure you add two to four minutes to the cook time. Add one cup of chicken broth to your potatoes and then that's all you have to do. Lock the lid, set the knob to sealing, then cook on manual high pressure for five to seven minutes depending on how large your potatoes are. These cooked for seven minutes. After the seven minutes are up, make sure you do a quick release, otherwise the potatoes may burn or brown on the bottom. Open the lid and check the potatoes with a fork or a knife to ensure that they're cooked all the way through. You shouldn't have any excess liquid in your Instant Pot, but if you do, just drain them and add them back to the Instant Pot. Then we like to mash our potatoes with butter and half and half, and I only do a little bit of salt because usually the gravy in the meal has a lot of salt in it, so I don't do too much salt in my mashed potatoes. I also recommend using an actual potato masher versus a stand or hand mixer because you don't want to over mix your potatoes. That's what makes them all gloopy and hard and starchy. So do them by hand and they are going to be amazing. First thing we do is just season our chicken tenderloins. I'm using four chicken tenderloins, but I would account for about two to three per person, depending on how big of a serving size you want to do. I'm going to season these with a little bit of garlic salt, or you can also do salt and garlic powder, some pepper and some ginger. Flip them over and do the exact same thing on the other side. And today we are using chicken tenderloins for all of these recipes. They're incredibly tender. They're really easy to cook because they cook really quickly. And so I like using that. But if you wanna use chicken breasts or chicken thighs, any of those will work. So first put your Instant Pot on high saute and then add about a tablespoon of extra virgin olive oil. When the Instant Pot is hot and the oil is nice and glisteny and shiny, then we can add in our seasoned chicken tenderloins. If you want to use a different kind of chicken, like a chicken breast or chicken thigh, just make sure that you cook it a little bit longer. But for the best, most consistent result, I would use the chicken tenderloins like we've used in the recipe today. I like to sear the chicken tenderloins. You're not cooking them through all the way, but I like to sear them on each side so that they can get a little bit of extra flavor. This step is completely optional if you don't have the time, but I highly recommend it because you want to add another layer of flavor to your chicken teriyaki rice bowls, and this will do that for you. After the chicken has seared on that other side, take out the chicken and just put them on a reserved plate. You'll notice all these yummy brown bits at the bottom of the pot, that's called a fond, and you want that because it's all that amazing flavor. However, you want to deglaze your pot with a cup and a half of water or chicken broth so it doesn't stick and burn onto your Instant Pot. So add in that liquid and then use a spatula or a wooden spoon and scrape all those brown bits off the bottom of the pot. Otherwise, you might get the burn notice. Next, add one cup of rice. Here I'm using long grain white rice, but you can also use jasmine rice or basmati rice. So after you kind of stir in your rice, then we are going to just add our chicken tenderloins right back on top of that rice and broth or water. And then I'm going to add half a cup of teriyaki sauce. You don't want to mix this because we don't want all that sugar getting mixed into the water too much. And so just add that chicken teriyaki marinade right over the top. You can either make your own or I just use a store-bought version. Close the lid, turn the knob to sealing, and then press the manual or pressure cook button and adjust to five minutes with a 10 minute natural pressure release. After the chicken and the rice are done, just open up that lid and then quickly add three to four cups of frozen vegetables. I like using this stir fry mix because it has a lot of really yummy vegetables that you find in a chicken teriyaki rice bowl and it's frozen so it's even easier. So add in the frozen vegetables and then give it a quick stir just to kind of toss in all those frozen vegetables into the hot chicken and rice. And then put the lid back onto the Instant Pot and then let it sit for about five minutes. And that's it. All you have to do is just scoop it into a bowl. And if you want, you can add some extra teriyaki sauce and some sesame seeds for some garnish. And that is a super easy, healthy, delicious meal that you can make for your family in less than 30 minutes. So first I'd like to start out with 
broccoli florets, you need to make sure that they are cut as evenly as possible. If you have small pieces and large pieces all mixed up together, they're going to cook at different times and different rates, so you want to make sure they are as uniform as possible. I personally like using just a pre-cut bag of broccoli that I get at like Costco or Sam's Club or just the grocery store because then it's cut and cleaned for me. I don't need to worry or fuss about it. Next, add your broccoli into a steamer basket, a steamer net, or some other accessory that is pressure cooker safe that's going to keep your broccoli off of the bottom of the pot. You just don't want it sitting in the water. My preference is to use a steamer basket, and this basket I've had for years. I love it. It's one of the best accessories for your Instant Pot. I promote it all day because it really is, I think, the number one accessory you should get for your Instant Pot. If you don't have a steamer basket or a steamer net, just try and put it on the trivet which came with your Instant Pot. That's that little metal rack thing that comes with your Instant Pot. Just place the broccoli on top of there and just try and keep it out of the water as much as possible. And then add one cup of water. Next, we're just going to put our basket full of broccoli into the Instant Pot. Don't add more than one cup of water because then it will take longer to come to pressure and longer to depressurize and it's cooking that whole time. So you really want to make sure that you're not going to overcook your broccoli. Next, just lock that lid on your Instant Pot. Turn your sealing knob from venting to sealing and then you're going to cook your broccoli for zero minutes. Yes, you heard me right. Just press the manual or pressure cook button on your Instant Pot and then press the minus button until it gets to zero. Yes, it's possible. It just means that it's going to come up to pressure and then it's done. It's not going to cook for however many minutes it usually pressure cooks for. After it has cooked for zero minutes and it beeps that it's done, give it a quick release as soon as possible. You don't want to leave your broccoli in there for a long time because it will get so mushy and that's disgusting. <laughs> so remove your lid and then check the doneness of your broccoli. If you can pierce it with a fork or a knife, then it's done. If your broccoli has a little bit of resistance to it, all you have to do is just place the lid back on your Instant Pot for about one to two minutes. Don't go longer than that because it will overcook and get mushy. So just put the lid back on and let the residual heat just steam through to just make sure it's fully cooked. Do not pressure cook your broccoli again because that will be overcooked and you'll just end up with broccoli soup. and. That's not what we're going for. Okay, after that, you wanna just remove it from your Instant Pot as quickly as possible to stop the cooking process, and then you've got perfectly made Instant Pot broccoli. We are going to start with one bag of Potatoes O'Brien. Like, could you think of anything easier than using frozen potatoes in a potato soup? Okay, next we're going to use eight ounces of cubed ham. I purchased mine just like this, but you can also do this recipe after Easter, Thanksgiving, Christmas, any of those holidays where you use a lot of you know ham and you might have some leftover. We'll do one can of corn. So simple. Then our spices are just one tablespoon of minced garlic and one teaspoon of real salt. Just throw that in there. We've got a quarter cup of baking crumbles. You can either cook and crumble this yourself or I just use the bagged, like pre-made bacon bits just to make it easy. And then we're gonna do two cups of chicken broth. And I always use two cups of water with two teaspoons of better than bouillon. So we'll just dump that straight over the top. And that's really it. I'm just going to mix it all together. And literally that's all you have to do. So I'm going to put the lid on my Instant Pot. Make sure that knob is set to the ceiling position. And then we're gonna cook this for three minutes on high pressure with a quick release. And then we'll add in just a couple extra ingredients. The potato ham chowder is done. So we are just going to, whoop, vent it. And this is what it looks like. It looks and smells amazing. To this, we are just going to add one cup of heavy cream. If you don't wanna do cream, I'm sorry. You could do half and half, you could do milk, but it just won't be quite as thick and creamy. So one cup of heavy cream, half a cup of sour cream. And then to that, we're just gonna add about half a cup of cheddar cheese or however much your heart desires. Like that one is so simple and easy. We've got potato ham chowder, so good for fall. 
always get so many compliments whenever I make my instant pot bacon green beans for a weeknight dinner or for the holidays. They are so delicious. So to start, we are going to press the saute button on the instant pot and adjust to high. Add three pieces of sliced thick cut bacon and cook them until they're nice and crispy. If you like, you can also add three large mushrooms that are diced up at this point, but I didn't have any today. So we're just going to add two tablespoons of dried onion flakes, one and a half tablespoons of minced garlic, deglaze the pot with half a cup of water mixed with one teaspoon of chicken better than bouillon, and it's going to be a little steamy because it's on saute, but then you also add two tablespoons of soy sauce. Then take a wooden spoon and scrape the bottom of the pot, all those brown bits. This is really important because we don't want anything to burn. Next add two pounds of fresh green beans that have been washed and the ends have been cut off. I like to use the French green beans. Mix everything together for a couple seconds, then lock the lid, turn the knob to sealing, and cook on manual high pressure for just two minutes. Allow a five minute natural pressure release, then remove the lid. Transfer the green beans to a serving bowl or a platter and make sure you get all of that sauce, the bacon, the mushrooms if you still have them, and pour it all over the green beans. These are so good for any type of dinner, but I love to serve them for the holidays. <laughs> If you're already making your hard-boiled eggs in the Instant Pot, you're a step ahead of most people. But what you don't know is that you might be doing it wrong. I'm willing to bet that you use one of these methods. The 555 method or the 666 method. Well, if you do, that's totally fine, but I'm here to show you an even better way. The only things you need are eggs, a cup of water, and something to keep them off the bottom of the pot. I personally use a steamer basket. If you don't have any of those, just make something out of some foil. You can make a little ring like this, you can make a little triangle, whatever it takes to keep them off the bottom of the pot. I'm just gonna fill up this basket with 12 eggs. This recipe works for as many eggs as you want. You can do one egg or you can do a full basket's worth. Now add in one cup of water. If you're using a three quart instant pot, use one cup of water. If you're using an eight quart instant pot, use one and a half cups of water, no more than that. The reason you don't want to add more water than that is because it's going to take longer to come to pressure and they're going to be cooking for even longer. You don't want overcooked eggs. Then throw the lid on, turn the knob to sealing, and then this is the most crucial part, the timing. For perfectly cooked Instant Pot hard boiled eggs, do two minutes on high pressure, followed by a 13 to 15 minute natural pressure release. Once you add the time onto your Instant Pot, it will pause momentarily and then say on. This means that your pot has registered the two minute cook time and it's starting to heat up and pressurize. Once your pot comes to pressure, this pin right here will pop up and it will be flush with the lid. If you hear any sputtering out of here, that's totally normal. So why do I do two minutes with a 13 to 15 minute natural pressure release? With the 555 or the 666 method, that intense pressure cook is cooking those eggs at a super high temperature for five or six whole minutes. It's as if you took a soda bottle or something carbonated in a can and just was shaking it for five or six minutes straight. That's a lot of pressure that's going to build in there. With my method going two minutes at high pressure, it gets a really intense pressure cook for only 120 seconds, and then it just gets to relax. <sighs> and now that we're at 15 minutes, I'm going to open the lid. And what I usually do is just take out the whole steamer basket full of eggs and rinse them under cold water. Put the steamer basket back in and then fill up the whole pot with cold water and ice. Cooling down the eggs like this immediately after they're done cooking is super important. The reason is because these eggs are super hot once they come out of the pressure cooker. We want to shock them with super ice cold water so then those peels and the membrane inside detaches from the wall of the shell. 
It also stops the cooking process, so then you have perfectly cooked eggs that aren't overdone. While these eggs were cooking, I also made a batch of eggs with a six minute cook time, a six minute natural pressure release, and an ice bath. And now we're going to compare the two. First, we're going to do a peel test, then we're gonna do a texture test, and then lastly, a taste test. First, we're going to start out with the 666 egg. I tap, put a little pressure on it, and roll. Doing so will make these eggshells just peel right off. I also find that if you peel them in water or under running water, they come out really well. There we go. Hey, that's a really nice egg. Next is our 215 egg. That was a beautiful egg as well. At a glance, you can't really tell a huge difference. And here are the fresh eggs from my mother-in-law. So I've noticed that these shells are a lot thinner than the eggs I get from the grocery store, but as you can see, this came off in just a huge piece. This is the six minute egg and this is the two minute egg. However, when I pick them up like this, I can definitely tell a difference. The white on the six minute egg is a lot firmer. It's almost bordering on rubbery. The yolk on the six minute egg is soft, almost feels a little gummy. The white on the two minute egg is cooked, but it's still a lot more tender. The yolk on the two minute egg is a little bit drier, but not so dry, but it's not gummy. I'm gonna do a little taste test on the six minute egg with a little bit of salt. That's a solid egg. That's a good egg. Next is the two minute egg. Mm. It's a subtle difference, but this one is a lot firmer. This one's nice and tender. And my teeth kind of sunk right into that egg yolk. With the six minute egg, it felt like there was just a little bit more resistance and it's a little gummy. So my final verdict is to do a two minute pressure cook with a 13 to 15 natural pressure release. Depending on your altitude and the freshness of your eggs, a 215 may feel a little overcooked to you. And if that's the case, just lessen the natural pressure release to 13 or 14 minutes. If you want your eggs to be cooked a little longer, of course, you just add a minute or two to the natural pressure release. Like I said, both are solid options, but this one definitely takes the cake. So to start out, we are going to add two tablespoons of olive oil to a hot instant pot. And then we are going to saute some Cajun sausage. So I ordered Cajun chicken sausage in my grocery order, but they accidentally gave me pork Cajun sausage. Totally fine, it all works right. You'll still count this as a chicken and rice recipe. So I like to just cut the sausage on the diagonal, on a bias, which is cut diagonally. And then we're going to saute that in the hot olive oil for just a couple of minutes. And then we're also going to add in our pretty vegetables. So I like to add one whole red bell pepper, one whole yellow bell pepper, and then three quarters of a cup of chopped celery. Mix that up and let it saute for just a minute while we put together our seasoning blend. So in this little bowl, I have one tablespoon of dried onion flakes, three teaspoons of Cajun seasoning, just use your favorite kind, but if it's really spicy, maybe do just one and a half or two teaspoons to start out a quarter teaspoon of thyme, a quarter teaspoon of smoked paprika, one teaspoon of oregano, and then we're just gonna shake this all up and dump it into our sausage and veggie mixture. After that, add one teaspoon of minced garlic, and then we're just going to let this saute for just a couple minutes. After the sausage and veggies have sauteed for a couple minutes and they have a little bit of brown on them, we're going to deglaze the pot with one tablespoon of soy sauce, half a cup of water, and one cup of chicken broth. We're also adding one cup of long grain white rice, and then just stir this all up. Make sure that there's nothing stuck on the bottom of the pot, otherwise it will get really burned and you don't want that. So scrape all that yummy flavor off the bottom of the pot, make sure the rice is submerged, and then we're ready to cook our Cajun sausage and rice. Lock the lid onto your Instant Pot, turn the knob from venting to sealing, and then cook on manual high pressure for five minutes with a 10 minute natural pressure release. 
This dish is really easy to make. It's spicy, it's saucy, it's really delicious. And I know you're going to enjoy it with your families. So tell me if you make this in the comments below. This next recipe for loaded baked potato soup is a reader favorite. And you can make this recipe using frozen hash brown potatoes like I am today, just because it's super easy. Or you can cut up your own potatoes, or you can even use leftover mashed potatoes. Let's get started by turning our Instant Pot to the high saute function. And then I'm going to add three to five pieces of thick cut bacon. Now, I definitely recommend using the thick cut bacon so then there's enough fat and flavor in the soup. So I have just a couple pieces of bacon that we're gonna add to our Instant Pot and crisp up. Here's a quick tip on your bacon. If you put your bacon in the freezer for about 20 minutes before you cut it, it will cut way easier. The fat will solidify in the bacon and you'll just be able to slice right through it without it getting slimy and all over the place. And did you know, when you cut bacon into little chunks like this, they're called bacon lardones. So when you see that in recipes, you'll now know cutting bacon into lardones is little pieces. The bacon's done crisping and I just scooped it out and put it in a separate bowl. Then you should have about a quarter cup of bacon grease in there and that's totally fine. Just keep that in because we wanna keep that flavor and a little bit of that fat. So to this, we are going to add one tablespoon of minced garlic. one two pound bag of hash brown potatoes. And you can use regular potatoes if you like. I've got those instructions on my website. Next, we have two tablespoons of onion flakes, a teaspoon of salt, and half a teaspoon of pepper. And just like the last recipe, this one's so awesome because you can pre-prepare this and use it as a freezer meal. Just put all these ingredients in a bag and prepare it from frozen, so it's really easy. Okay, mix that around for a minute. And then we're going to add two cups of chicken broth. I always use two cups of hot water with two teaspoons of better than bouillon. Perfect. If you like, you can add a little bit of that bacon to cook in with it, but I prefer to sprinkle it on the top because I think it just kind of looks prettier, but you can also cook it in the soup as well. And that's it, we're gonna put the lid on it, we're gonna cook it for three minutes from frozen, and then we'll add a couple extra ingredients at the end. The loaded baked potato soup is ready to come out, so I just turned the knob from the ceiling to the venting position, and this is what it looks like. Now this is the fun part. After you pressure cook the loaded potato soup, you're going to take a potato masher and just mash these potatoes up about five or eight times just to kind of break up some of those potatoes. We don't wanna make mashed potatoes, so we're just going to mash it up just a little bit to still have some chunks, but not too many. To this, we are going to add one cup of heavy cream because heavy cream just makes everything more delicious. If you don't wanna use cream, you can use milk, half and half. And then this is what makes it taste like loaded baked potato soup. It's one cup of sour cream. This is so good. That sour cream is really important because it makes it taste like an actual loaded baked potato and not just potato soup. And then we've got one cup of shredded cheddar cheese. I always add extra on top of each bowl. I like to let that kind of melt down. I also like adding some of the bacon back into the soup but I also like having a lot of it to kind of put on top of each bowl, just because then it's really pretty. But we can put some of that in there as well. And that's it. This only cooked for three minutes. It used a frozen bag of potato hash browns and it tastes like you slaved over it all day. I will never make cranberry sauce on the stove again after using my Instant Pot. To begin, add 12 ounces of washed fresh cranberries to your Instant Pot, and I'm using my three quart Instant Pot here today, and then add three quarters of a cup of sugar. You can also do half a cup of sugar, kind of play around with how sweet you like it. Next, add a quarter cup of apple juice, and I didn't have apple juice today, so I just used some applesauce. That's 
totally fine. Then add a quarter cup of orange juice. You can use fresh or, you know, whatever you get at the grocery store. And then grate in about a quarter teaspoon to half a teaspoon of fresh ginger. This really makes a big difference. And if you can get fresh, I definitely recommend it. If you don't have fresh, just use a little bit of powdered ginger and that will work fine as well. Then I always eyeball just about half a teaspoon of cinnamon. We love cinnamon in ours, so I usually add just a little extra. Mix to coat and combine all of the ingredients and then we will pressure cook this for just five minutes on high pressure. The big thing with this is to make sure that you allow a full natural pressure release. This usually takes about 30 minutes because if you don't, you will have cranberry sauce going everywhere. Cranberry sauce will froth and you want to make sure that that pressure comes down very slowly and naturally. After the 30 minutes, remove the lid and stir until those berries break up a little bit and you get the consistency to your liking. If you want it a little bit thicker, you can simmer this on low saute for a couple minutes to reduce it, but once it cools, it will thicken up. You can store this in the refrigerator for several weeks before Thanksgiving, so you can make this early on. Look how delicious this looks and I use it on turkey sandwiches, pork tenderloin, and of course, Thanksgiving dinner. So what you need to do first is mix your milk with the starter. You can do this in a bowl, a pitcher, in the Instant Pot liner itself, but tonight I decided to just do it in a blender because it was easy and I wanted a pitcher to pour into these smaller containers. The most important thing with this step is you want to make sure that your starter is completely incorporated into the milk before you let it ferment. If you have chunks of your starter still in the milk and it's not completely just dissolved, it can get kind of gritty and we don't wanna do that. I just added two tablespoons of starter to the blender with the milk and then you want to just blend that until it's completely dissolved. Like I said, I'm only using a blender or pitcher because I was lazy and I knew I could use this to pour into smaller containers, but you can use a bowl, a liner, anything to mix milk with the yogurt. At this point, you can also add your sweet and condensed milk if you like, if you want it sweetened. If not, just leave it out. In this video, I'm going to show you two methods on how you can make your Instant Pot yogurt. The first one is going to be in these pre-portioned individual containers. You can also use mason jars or anything that's like a small little vessel to make your yogurt in. So if you want to make individual serving sizes, all you have to do is pour that milk mixture into your container. This isn't going to rise like a cupcake. You just put as much milk in your cup as you want to eat. So in this cup, I have about eight ounces of milk and this was a really good perfect portion. It's nice because if you want to leave room at the top, you totally can. So you can add toppings, granola, fruit, whatever you want. So to make them in the individual portions, you just put them in whatever you want to ferment them in. And then you add two cups cups of water to your Instant Pot and the trivet or something to keep the yogurt off the bottom of the pot. You can see in my example from last night that I did two plain and one I added some monk fruit sweetener to and a little bit of vanilla extract and vanilla bean paste. This is the finished product from that and while it tastes really good, about one in every 10 to 15 times I make this, if I add anything else to the yogurt, sometimes I can get this kind of gloopy consistency. It's kind of stringy. And while it tastes fine, the texture is a little off-putting. So I generally like to recommend not putting vanilla in your yogurt before fermentation. I like to just mix it in after it's done setting if you want to add vanilla to your yogurt. Next, you just add your cups of milk and starter to the Instant Pot on top of that trivet and then you want to cover it with something. Instant Pot Company sells a specific glass lid that you can put on top of your Instant Pot, but I find that I usually have a pot lid that will fit just fine and then you don't have to spend the money. A lot of times people will ask if they can just use their Instant Pot lid and you can, but I don't recommend it. The reason is because if you give your Instant Pot lid a sniff, and you guys know I love to smell, smell everything, this lid can really capture a lot of the smells no matter how good of a job you do washing it. And so this smells savory. It smells like food, and I don't want any of those smells to absorb into that milk, into the yogurt, unless you want 
dinner flavored yogurt, which is pretty gross. <laughs> so I like to just take this off and not risk it. I will use a glass lid that I have from my pots and pans, or you can even use something as simple as a dinner plate. Next, you want to press the yogurt button and then adjust it to the normal setting. You can press either the yogurt button or the adjust button depending on your Instant Pot model. You don't want it on low, you don't want it on high. If it says boil, start over, that's not the right setting. Set it to normal yogurt. After that, you can adjust the time from six to 12 hours. I find that anything in a little container doesn't take as much time. So you're good between six, eight, 10 hours. But I will tell you, the longer you ferment the yogurt, the more tart it will be. So we'll just let these sit overnight in the Instant Pot and then we'll move on to the next method. The next way you can make your Instant Pot yogurt is simply by pouring it into the Instant Pot liner and making a huge vat of yogurt. There's no difference between putting it in the actual liner versus just putting it in a smaller container. I guess the only difference is that you don't add water. So to do this, I'm just going to pour the rest of the blender into the Instant Pot liner, and then we're going to do the same thing. Press the yogurt button and then adjust to normal. And then I'm going to do about 10 hours on this larger batch because it will just take a little bit longer to do that whole pot versus just a smaller cup. And then I usually just go to sleep. <laughs> It's not a big deal if the yogurt sits for like an hour or two after it's done. It's not going to go bad. It's totally fine. But you'll notice that after you press the yogurt button on your Instant Pot, it will beep and then it will say 0000. From this point, it's going to start counting up to let you know how long the yogurt has been fermenting. After the yogurt is done, it will say yo. <laughs> In my family, we actually call it Instant Pot Yogged <laughs> because that's what the Instant Pot says. But after it's done, it will say Y-O-G-T, meaning it's done fermenting for the amount of time that you set it for. So now it just ferments overnight and then in the morning, it will be nice and set and then we will put it in the fridge. Now it's sometime between six and 7 a.m. The yogurts have been fermenting overnight and they look great. You'll be able to tell that it has a very sweet, slightly sour but fresh aroma. It's really pleasant, honestly, and it won't smell bad. It won't smell like rotten milk. So first we're going to check on our little yogurt cups. There's going to be condensation on the lid. So just make sure when you take off the lid or the plate, whatever you're using to cover your Instant Pot, that you're not dumping all that condensation on the surface of your yogurt. You can pick these up. They're not super hot. They are warm, but you'll see that they are set. This is what you're looking for. They are not going to set any more than at this stage right now. They're not going to get firmer in the fridge. So if your yogurt is completely liquid at this this point something has gone wrong and unfortunately you're not going to be able to make that into yogurt I'm sorry however using this method using the milk and the faye I've never had that happen before so hopefully you'll be fine so these look great we are just going to cover them and put them in the fridge for about eight hours or until they're chilled. Next, we are going to go over to the full pot of Instant Pot yogurt and I'm gonna hurry this morning. I've got to do carpool, kids, all the things. So it says that there is a little bit of time left on it, but it looks totally set and it looks great, smells great. So I'm just going to go ahead and take it out. When I put the entire Instant Pot liner in the fridge, I like to make sure that I have a towel or a silicone trivet under it, just so then that heat from the bottom of the pot's not transferring into the fridge. And now we're ready to eat. The Instant Pot yogurt has been sitting in the fridge this whole time. And the one thing I really love to show people is to do something called the spoon test. So that is when you take a spoon and you just stick it straight into your Instant Pot liner and that spoon should stick straight up and down. The yogurt will be firm, thickened, deliciousness, and it's ready to eat. This is what the yogurt looks like. It's literally just perfect yogurt consistency and texture. You can also sweeten this yogurt with anything you like. You can mix in berries, honey, any kind of sweetener that you want, and it will last in your fridge for about seven to 10 days. Well, if it lasts that long. My kids eat it, like they demolish it when I make this. So just like if you buy store-bought yogurt, if you make an indent in your yogurt and let it sit, there will be a little puddle of whey. 
That's completely normal and that happens with any yogurt that you have because that whey kind of separates and it naturally pulls out from the yogurt. You can just mix that whey in or you can dump it in the sink. You can also use it for like smoothies and like mix it into things for added health benefits, but yeah, I don't do that. <laughs> So that's really all there is to it. It's incredibly simple, so delicious, and I love that you just get to know what's in your food. We like to serve our Instant Pot yogurt with frozen berries, some granola, and little mini chocolate chips. It's really good like that. It's like a little treat, and my kids love it. It's great for meal prep. It's great for, you know, just a low calorie snack, and I know you're gonna love it too. So first we're going to start out by sauteing a half pound of thick cut bacon in the Instant Pot and then taking that out after it has crisped up. I've already done that here. And then I leave about two tablespoons of the bacon grease inside the pan. Next we're gonna add one chopped onion and I just use pre-chopped onion. <laughs> right in there with all of that bacon grease. And then we're gonna do one pound of Jimmy Dean sausage. I find that the Jimmy Dean brand is actually like worth splurging on. I don't really like using store brand sausage. This one just tastes really good. And since it's the main protein, I definitely recommend just spending a little bit extra to get the higher quality sausage. To the sausage and the onions, I'm adding two tablespoons of minced garlic. And then to this, one teaspoon of salt, half a teaspoon of pepper, and half a teaspoon of crushed red pepper flakes. If you don't like it spicy, then just do just a pinch of the red pepper flakes. You still want that flavor. And then you just, we're gonna use that little chopper masher thing that I bought on that Amazon video I did earlier this summer. And we want to just chop this all up. Try and lift up some of that fond on the bottom of the pot from the bacon. All those browned bits, that's all flavor that we want to suck off the bottom of the pot and scrape off. The meat and the onions are looking good. They don't have to be like 100% done, just like 90% done, cause it's all gonna cook. Okay, to this, we are going to add one cup of chicken broth. So I have my chicken broth here. It's just six cups of water with six teaspoons of better than bouillon. I like to just do like one cup right at the beginning and then deglaze the pot. So the pot is still on saute mode. I'm just taking my Thermalworks spatula, my silicone spatula, it's the best one out there, and just scrape everything off the bottom of the pot. We really want to make sure that all that flavor is lifted off the pot. So one, we get that flavor and it tastes good. Second, because we don't want it to burn and get the burn notice. All right, it looks good. Okay, so to this we are going to add five potatoes. I think this is about five cups. Um, five or six potatoes. I find one regular like small to medium potato is usually about one cup. So I cut these up into little triangles like you can see here. It's very simple. Now we're gonna add the rest of our chicken broth. If you'd like to do a lower carb option, you can do cauliflower in place of the potatoes. If you like more meat, you can add an additional pound of sausage. I usually like to do two more cups of liquid when I do that. And that's it. I do not like to pressure cook with the crispy bacon in there because I feel like it kind of gets soggy. So I'm just going to cook this for one minute on high pressure. The reason it's only one minute is because everything else is cooked besides the potatoes and these potatoes are super tiny. We don't wanna make mashed potatoes so we just want to cook these through. It only takes one minute. So we're gonna put the lid on and pressure cook for one minute. The Zupa Toscana is done. It only cooked for one minute and this is what it looks like. So you'll see when you take off the lid, there's kind of a red film on there. That's just some fat. If you use a spicy sausage, this will be really red. So if you don't like it, you can just use a skimmer and just take off some of that fat off the top. If it doesn't bother you, which it doesn't really bother me, you can just leave it. So to this, we are going to now add one bunch of kale that we chiffonaded. And I like to kind of massage it with my fingers or like with my hands a little bit, just to um, tenderize the kale. So we are going to add one bunch or however much you want. If you don't like that much kale, don't put in that much kale. But we are just going to let this wilt for just a second. So I kind of press it down. We don't want to crush up those beautiful potatoes. So you want to be really gentle. And you can see some of the potatoes have broken and then that skin on the potato turns into a little ribbon. It's really pretty, just swimming throughout the soup. And that kale only takes about one or two minutes to really wilt down. And then we'll add the rest of our bacon 
or if you wanna save some for the top, you can always do that as well. And then the last ingredient, which is the best, is just one cup of heavy cream. If you don't wanna do heavy cream, you don't have to. It's really good without the cream, but we really like the cream. <laughs> now mix that in. And this is a showstopper. It's delicious. You can add a little bit of extra salt and pepper or crushed red pepper flakes if you like, but we love it just like this. Enjoy. We're going to start off with three slices of thick cut bacon and I've already gone ahead and crisped that and then leave that in the pot. To this, we are going to add half of an onion. about one cup of diced celery, five cups of red potatoes, and I just, I just cut them up into little tiny chunks like that. If you don't want to cut the red potatoes, you can also use the hash brown potatoes, but I just really like the color of the potatoes in this soup. I think it looks really pretty. And like, just like the other soup, usually one red potato is about one cup. If they're a little bit smaller, they might be a little bit less than a cup. Wow, it already smells good. <laughs> All right, to that, we're gonna add one tablespoon of minced garlic, three teaspoons of salt, three quarters of a teaspoon of thyme, and three quarters of a teaspoon of pepper. I'm just gonna dump all of that in there. And then I like to let this saute for just a couple minutes to kind of embed all that bacony goodness into the vegetables. To the vegetable mixture, we are going to deglaze the pot with three tablespoons of white cooking wine. This really gives the soup like a really yummy flavor. And then one and a half cups of chicken broth. So I just use the one and a half cups of hot water and one and a half teaspoons of better than bouillon. Then I'm going to take the clam juice out of two cans of clams. So here I have a 10 ounce can and this one is a six and a half ounce can of clams. I just drain these. So I strain the juice and I'm gonna use that juice. Make sure you keep the clams because we're gonna add those later. So to this, we are going to add the clam juice. This is about one and a quarter cup. Make sure you strain it, otherwise you might get some like little piece of shell in there. Don't want that. And that's it. Make sure you scrape the bottom of the pot to deglaze it. We don't want it to burn. Gotta lift up all that bacon flavor. I also forgot, just add one bay leaf in there and then you can pressure cook. And now we're going to let this cook for two minutes on high pressure with a quick release. All of these recipes are so quick and easy. I really love that. Soup is done. Oh my, and it smells delicious. All right, first thing I'm going to do is just fish out that bay leaf because we don't eat bay leaves. That, we'll just take that out, throw that away. And then we're going to add the clams from the 10 ounce can and the six and a half ounce can. We made sure to rinse them because we don't want any little questionable pieces or any little shells. So we're going to add that and just let them kind of warm through. And you can also add the bacon now, or you can add it in, you know, on the top. Like I said, I like to do both. I usually make extra bacon actually for this recipe. Okay, this looks great. I am going to turn it back on saute mode for just a second. And then we are going to thicken this soup using three cups of heavy cream mixed with six tablespoons of all purpose flour. All I do is I take the flour and I whisk it into the heavy cream and it becomes just kind of like a roux paste and it's really nice. So we've got our three cups of heavy cream mixed with six tablespoons of all-purpose flour. Just gonna add that right into the soup. Okay, and then I just bring this to a boil and then that will thicken it up really nicely. It's fantastic. I like to serve clam chowder in a sourdough bread bowl or with really crusty classic French bread. It's amazing. Okay, and there you go, enjoy. 